here, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share my story with all of you. Um, I'm coming from a special perspective about the Kenyan elections. I have three different lenses about the Kenyan elections. One lens is that of a scholar. As you've heard from my very kind introduction, I have studied East Africa for over 10 years, and I am a specialist in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania. And I also know quite a bit about infrastructure and information technology in those countries, which, strangely enough, emerged in this election as an issue. Another perspective that I have is of somebody of Kenyan descent. I grew up in America. I'm an American citizen, and I'm very American in all my ways, but I'm half Kenyan, and I married a Kenyan, so I do have a connection to the country. And then, finally, I have the perspective of an accredited observer, which you'll hear a little bit more about. Okay, I just want to give you a very brief overview of independence and electoral history in Kenya. So first of all, Kenya was a British colony. Colonization started in the late 1880s and it ended in the early 1960s. Essentially, there was a small guerrilla war between the Mau Mau and the British colonialists. There were not very many people killed, but it was enough to persuade the British that although Kenya was a temperate, beautiful place, it was no longer viable as a colony. One of the leaders of the independence movement was Jomo Kenyatta. He was actually a scholar in his own right. He studied at the University of London, and he's actually a very well-known anthropologist, or was a well-known anthropologist, and he published a fantastic book called Facing Mount Kenya, which is one of the most reliable documents on traditional history. Now, under Kenyatta, Kenya was famous for being the jewel of East Africa. It was a prosperous country, it was well regarded internationally, and it was very peaceful and stable. On the downside, it was not democratic. So opposition leaders were often assassinated or simply marginalized. And in fact, the Mau Mau, who had won independence for Kenya, got nothing out of his presidency. After Kenyatta died in 1979, his vice president took over the helm of the country. Now, his vice president was named Daniel Eret Moy, there in the bottom right corner, and he's known as the professor of politics. Although he was simply had an eighth grade education, he became a teacher and was a master of controlling Kenyan politics, and some say he controls it even to this day. Basically, after the Cold War ended, donors felt that it was no longer reasonable to keep giving Kenya so much money, given that it was not democratic at all. So Kenya entered a period of democratization in the early 1990s. So we've had elections of varying levels of success since 1992, and the opposition in Kenya was unable to, meet, to beat President Moy until 2002 because they just couldn't unite. So his party, Kanu, stayed in power throughout this period. Now, the 2002 elections were a real watershed for Kenyan democracy. Mwai Kibaki, who unfortunately had actually served under the Moy regime, as did Raila Odinga, who you'll hear more about, finally was able to unify the opposition. So he was able to create a coalition of all the fractured parties, and they came together in something called the National Rainbow Coalition. He actually defeated Uhuru Kenyatta, who was Moy's preferred successor and represented Kanu. Now, this was a period of great civil society organization. Civil society in Kenya is extremely strong, and there was a lot of work around improving the Kenyan constitution in this period as well. This was a peaceful election and was generally very happy, and people were really excited about the 2002 elections. Unfortunately, the next election was not as peaceful or as happy. Mwai Kibaki, who went to the London School of Economics and is considered an intellectual, actually really disappointed international observers and tarnished his legacy. 
So in, in 2007, 2008, it happened right around the Christmas New Year's period, Odinga had an early lead, but after an amazing overnight switch, Kibaki ended up winning by approximately 200,000 votes. Now you have to realize that the 2009 census says Kenya has 40 million people, so this is just the narrowest of margins. There were allegations of rigging, but I think really what we saw here was a process that was not transparent, the organizations were disorganized, the institutions were weak, so really it's hard to know what happened at all. But as an aftermath of the election, there was massive ethnic violence, and it was very brutal. So one group, the, the, the Kalenjin, focused their enmity on the Kikuyu, the largest tribe or the largest ethnic group in Kenya, and also the group which Mwai Kibaki comes from. But these young men who were paid by other politicians, so this was paid political violence, it was not spontaneous. They, not only did they kill Kikuyu, but they raped and murdered wives in front of their husbands. They burned a church down with children and women who were sheltering there. And they actually lined people up in a Rwandan genocide style and asked for their ID cards so that they could kill them. Now, land issues were at the forefront of this con conflict. The Rift Valley is a place where many different ethnic groups live together. However, only one third of the land in Kenya is actually arable, so there's extreme land pressure in Kenya. And in the Rift Valley, you have traditional pastoralists like the Kalenjin and like the Maasai competing with traditional agriculturalists like the Kisi and like the Kikuyu for farming land. At the end of this conflict, we had over 1,000 dead and at least 300,000 displaced. It could be more, and many of these people are still internally displaced. So after the bloodshed of 2007 and 2008, there was a real movement towards re-democratization and, an, and a realization that the 2002 election had gone well, but that the institutions of democracy were still very weak in Kenya. So the 2010 constitution did a lot of important things. It replaced the old 1969 constitution. It was approved by a vast majority of Kenyan voters. There were major improvements made in voting technology. Like the United States, Kenya has a first-past-the-post system, which means it's a winner-take-all system. So there are not lists. There are not, it's just straight, you win, you lose. So it's not a coalition government scenario. Now, in order to be elected president in Kenya, you have to meet two requirements. First, you have to get at least 25% of the vote in half of Kenya's 47 counties. Secondly, for a presidential candidate to avoid a runoff, he or she must get at least 51% of the vote. Also, importantly, the Kenyan constitution moved away from the old British provincial system and broke Kenya into 47 different counties. Now, some of these counties are ethnically homogenous and some are more multi-ethnic. So, 2010 Constitution, fascinating document, very progressive document. Whether its promise will be fulfilled is as yet unknown. Now, in the run-up to the election, we had seven major candidates. So, this is Uhuru Kenyatta. He was the son of Jomo Kenyatta, the first president. He was handpicked by Moy as his successor. And if you wanted to be critical of him, you could say that he's a spoiled plutocrat whose family owns approximately one third of the land in Kenya. <laughs> this guy, Raila Odinga, he um, is the son of Oginga Odinga, who was a head opposition leader. So these are both essentially dynastic successors. Now, Raila Odinga, the nicest thing you can say about him is he's always been in the loyal opposition. He is definitely a, he's generally been considered a pro-egalitarian, pro-democracy advocate. 
But like Moai Kibaki, he worked in the Moi regime. None of these guys are clean as a whistle. So, and on the worst day, what you could say about him was he clearly had a hand in the ethnic violence that happened in 2007 and 2008. And he has almost like a cult-like hold on his people. Now, Mudavadi is a Luya, and he, these, this is a very important swing group in this election. We also had a woman running. She was a terrific anti-corruption candidate, Martha Karua, very educated, a lawyer, a former congresswoman. We call the member of parliament in Kenya. Peter Kenneth, also a terrific anti-corruption candidate. He's done an amazing job developing his constituency, used his money well, shown what development can do. We had Ole Kiape, who is a Maasai, a scholar, a professor, very interested in environmental and land issues. And what happened was we ended up having what I consider to be a somewhat bizarre coalition between Kenyatta and Ruto because Remember, Kenyatta is a Kikuyu, so it was his ethnic group that was really murdered during the 2007-2008 election. And Odinga was definitely, I mean, Odinga had a hand in this, but the vice presidential candidate, Ruto, also had a hand in this. So Kenyatta joined with Ruto, so it's like politics makes strange bedfellows, a classic example of this. Now, in terms of ethnicities, you're going to hear a lot about ethnicities in the Western press. I really don't like this focus, and I do believe that people's ethnic identities are changing over time, especially in urban areas. However, you'll see that, let's take the 40 million population number. From the last census, these are the ethnic group numbers. Now remember, Kenya has 42 distinct language groups. Those are not dialects, they're languages, so they're distinct peoples. The largest of those is the Kikuyu. They represent approximately 22% of the population. But if you take them together with their close neighbors, the Meru and the Embu, who tend to vote very connectedly with the Kikuyu, they can represent as much as 30% of the population. The major swing groups are the Luya and the Kamba. These are very important swing groups. So, also, Kisi and Mijikenda, otherwise known as Swahili. There's another group called Swahili, but they're closely related. So the swing groups really mattered in this election. Nobody can get 50% by themselves. They have to work in a coalition. The Kikuyu, if every Kikuyu votes along party lines, which they don't, if they voted strictly along ethnic lines, you might get 30%. But it's not the case that everybody votes on, on ethnic lines. So the Kamba really matter in this story. All of these other groups matter, and you know there's 42 others. And then you see these people who think they're Kenyan? These people don't have a tribal affiliation. They may have one, but they identify as Kenyan. Now, how are I am on time? Okay. So then another wrinkle to this story is after the violence of 2007 and 2008, Kenyatta and Ruto, I told you, are strange bedfellows, were both charged with crimes against humanity for their role in the violence in 2007 and 2008. So that's the Hague case that you keep hearing about in the news. I'd like to point out, though, that Jendai Fraser, former Undersecretary for African Affairs, noted that Luis Moreno Ocampo, who was the prosecutor at the ICC who brought the charges against these characters, has only brought crimes against humanity charges against Africans. He brought none against Latin Americans, none against Europeans, none against Asians, and none against North Americans. So this is a, definitely a critique. Another critique was that the People who were charged were not all the people who were guilty. So Kibaki could have stopped the violence. President Kibaki could have stopped the violence, but he did nothing. Odinga definitely had a hand or knowledge about the violence, but he was not charged. There are many people who could have been charged who were not charged. And if you wanted to take a pro-Kenyatta stance, so I'm not saying that this is my belief, but a pro-Kenyatta person might say that 
so many Kikuyu and Bantu were killed that the fact that even if Kenyatta had a hand in electoral violence, which hasn't been proven, that was just self-defense because they can only link him to about 20 murders and it was self-defense against the mass of electoral violence that was going on. So this is kind of the backdrop of this election. Now as part of this election, in the 2010 Constitution, we have the formation of a new organization. This is an independent regulatory agency. It's the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. It was created in a provision of the 2010 Constitution. It has nine commissioners and is currently led by Isak Hassan. So the IEBC is the only organization which has the authority to count votes, manage elections, and announce winners at the national level. Now, there was an effort to increase the level of technology. So the idea was we were gonna have biometric voting machines, people would identify themselves with a thumbprint as they went in to vote, and that specially organized cell phones would send an electronic tally to the National Tallying Center. And this was all going to back up the manual voting process to make it more transparent and fairer. Now, the core system, though, was a manual register. So you had a manual voters register and paper ballots to have a paper audit trail. So. In my capacity as an accredited observer, I was accredited by the National Media Council of Kenya, and I worked for a group called the Journalists for Human Rights Network. When I say I worked for them, I didn't, I paid to be an observer, they didn't pay me. <laughs> I paid about $50 for my card, but um, what I observed, and I'm drawing on my background as a policy analyst and as an attorney, my personal observation was that this was a free and fair election. My card got me in everywhere in the country, so I was able to go watch people voting at five different polling stations. So I selected these five stations carefully, kind of cross-section. So I saw two deep Nairobi counting areas, Kalsa, which is just in downtown Nairobi, Kasarani, which is kind of on the edge of Nairobi, very multi-ethnic stations. Then I went to one peri-urban area, Thika, which is on the way into the Mount Kenya area and is also multi-ethnic. So if there were going to be any violence, it would have been at these stations. I also went to two upcountry stations in an ethnically homogenous area, Moronga and Othaya, in the Mount Kenya region. And the reason I chose those are because I'm, I have family there, I understand my way around, I knew how to stay safe there. I, it was expected to be an extremely violent election, so my priority was to stay safe. So I picked a path where I had translators if I needed them or people to protect me at every point. I didn't need that because it was completely peaceful and completely quiet and people were totally orderly. I also was able to watch the presidential vote be counted at the final polling station, and I also saw votes reported at both the constituency and the national level. So the day of the election was amazing. There was 86% voter turnout, a number we can only dream about in the United States. The lines were incredibly long. At one point in Thika, we measured with our vehicle a line that was two miles long of voters queuing. Then people queued into the night. So the IEBC closed the elections at five, but what they did, because there were so many people in line, was that they said, if you were in line at five o'clock, we're gonna let you vote. So everybody who was in line at five o'clock was allowed to vote. So some of the polling stations stayed open until two or three in the morning to allow all those people to vote. Unfortunately, the idea of the new technology making the system work better was a total failure. A lot of the technology broke down, and remember I actually, study information technology in East Africa. I personally witnessed two or three biometric voter registers go down in front of me. And I also witnessed the cell phones not working. And some, some of the technology breaking down was, was ridiculous because there's always problems with electricity in Nairobi and in Kenya and they didn't have backup generators and they didn't have a system for charging the computers. They also hadn't well trained um, observers to use the passwords to use the equipment. 
So at the end of the day, we resorted to a manual system. Well, interestingly, I worked on a voting conference after the Bush-Gore election at the Kennedy School, and the findings that we made are that technology can help make elections more flexible, but it also introduces an entirely new level of chaos. So um, that was definitely the case in this election. Okay, this is a picture of the old first president, Jomo Kenyatta, with his son, Uhuru Kenyatta, who is to become the fourth president of Kenya. So Kenyatta, any way you slice it, he won this election handily. The Western press has reported that he won by a narrow margin. That is not correct. He won by seven percentage points. So Raila Odinga got 43% of the vote. Kenyatta got 50.07% of the vote. So there was a very big margin of victory. The small, narrow thing that the press is referring to is did we make it to 51%? Because remember, to avoid a runoff, the candidate has to reach 51% and 25% threshold in half of the counties. So he did beat the 50% margin with 8,000 votes. But there is no question that he clearly um, outpolled his opponent. So on March 9th, when the results came out, which was about five days after the election, I have to tell you, everybody was completely stressed out in those five days and stayed in their houses. There were helicopters flying overhead, people with machine guns everywhere. There was heavy police and military presence, but people were very quiet and very calm. There was no disruption whatsoever. Now, we all thought that was the end of it, that he had won. But right after the IEBC made the announcement, Raila Odinga challenged the election's result. He claimed that the widespread failure in technology showed that the election was a failure and that in over 30 constituencies, voter turnout had totaled more than 100%. Uh, so the good news about this challenge was that it was done in the courts and not on the street and there was a massive media effort to have a peaceful election. But people were very worried that this challenge could create some violence and just delayed the tension and delayed the results. So it's pretty spectacular that in this whole process there, there really wasn't any violence. Now what, what ended up happening was that the Supreme Court took the petitions and they said, we're going to retally 22 of the polling stations and see what we find. So they took the 30 constituencies Odinga had identified, and out of those, they selected 22 polling stations, and they retallied every single vote in those polling stations. Now, what they found was that there were some discrepancies and problems with the technology, but of the 22 stations that they evaluated, only only 20% of those had any irregularities. So on March 30th, the Supreme Court upheld Kenyatta's victory, and on April 15th, the Supreme Court issued a ruling that went into hundreds of pages, actually, explaining their reasoning. Now, one thing you want to note about the Supreme Court is it's got very multi-ethnic composition. Just by reading the names Mutungu, Mutunga, Tunoy, Ojuang, Ibrahim, Wanjala, Ndungo, we have somebody, one person from the group of each of the challengers, but we also have pe people from different types of swing groups, including Swahili, Kalenjin, and Luya on the court. Now, this court made a unanimous ruling. That's very important because it's entirely possible that you could have had dissent on the court, but there wasn't a dissenting opinion. So they believe that there were a few irregularities, there were problems with information capture, but these problems were not so substantial as to affect the credibility of the election process. So what I'd like to do now is I'm just going to show you some pictures to give you the feel of the election, and then I'm going to wrap up. Now this is Othaya Town. This is where my family is from. This is my beloved uncle, who my baby is named after. This is my favorite cousin, Washira. And this is the chief guide for my husband's safari company. And this is in front of my 
uncle's store. This is, gives you an idea of what this looks like. This is Othaya region. This is kind of what the town of Othaya looks like. This gives you a sense of the campaign level, so very heavily campaigning, a lot of posters. Here's Uhuru. This is an MP, a congressman running. You had posters even on trees. This gives you a sense of what the town of Moranga looks like. These are the two upcountry locations I had told you about, just you know, so you can picture it in your mind. As I mentioned, they were very long lines. So this is at 7 in the morning in downtown Nairobi. That line was at least two miles long. And this is in Kasarani. You see this crowd of voters, how intense that is. They sent women to the front of the line so that they didn't have to stay outside because some people queued for as much as eight hours and the sun was blazing that day. It was probably 90 degrees with very bright sunlight. So this is early in the morning and they have, they generally overdress their children in Kenya. <laughs> so this gives you a sense of what the polling process looked like. So they had different colors that represented different races. White is the presidential election. So then each of these, this is pink, was the women's candidates. So each of the different races had a different color and you got six different ballots. These are the polling booths that were used. These are IEBC officials. So this is in downtown Nairobi. You see the biometric voter registration computer and you also see the manual register. This is early in the morning while it, everything was still working. So here, this is in Moranga. All the technology had stopped working at that point. This is an upcountry location. And we're down to the manual registers. This shows you the process of, of counting the votes. Here she's showing a ballot. Each, each polling station had political party agents for each of the parties who were running. So there are about seven parties represented in that room, along with me, an accredited observer, uh, observer, and another accredited observer from an organization called Uchaguzi. This is the polling station officer. Then here we are finalizing the voting, and they're putting the ballots into the presidential box. This is the manual register. This picture gives you a sense of kind of what the ballots looked like. And you see we were working by kerosene lantern at night. This is the constituency hall. The main thing here I want you to notice is all the polling officers are in yellow. They're on a dais in front of the entire how, the entire hall, which is full of political party agents, candidates, and independent observers, and I ran into several Carter Center officials at this constituency. So if you're going to rig this election, it's not easy. There are 300 people. It's heavily militarized, heavy police present. This is the reporting officer. Actually, one candidate was angry at one of the polling officers, so they made him sit to the side, and he's showing the ID of the Criti criticized polling officer to show that he was who he said he was. So th these people are doing their work in public. There's a heavy media presence. This is the National Tallying Center in downtown Nairobi. This is the only place where my credentials were checked 100%, but they wouldn't let in my research assistant. And this shows you the media presence. They're announcing the results and this is a sign language interpreter. And here, in one of the more spectacular technology um, moments, the server at the National Tallying Center failed. <laughs> um, this gives you the campaign posters for the people who won the election. Now, the final verdict. I'm happy to report that what I saw co coincided perfectly with what the Carter Center saw. Uh, my basic opinion, and you'll see that in the Al Jazeera, that was released the day before the Supreme Court election, was that the technological failures were avoidable, they were very disappointing, but they did not disrupt the validity of the manual voting process. And that is exactly what the Carter Center found. And, oops, oh, technology. All right. So. Anyway, can you help me get back to that? So basically, the Carter Center verdict was that the results reflect the will of the people. The elections 
logistical group, which was the Kenyan electoral group, said that the official results were consistent with their own independent parallel voter tabulation. And finally, the European Union, which had 65 observers from 25 member states, said that the democratic spirit of Kenyans prevailed. I can get the rest of it. Okay. Okay, so where are we now? Where we are now, these are the candidates all together after the election laughing. So this is Kenyatta, this is Ruto, this is Odinga, and this is Kalonzo Musioka, the former vice president. Now, the good news is that institutions have been strengthened in Kenya and the democratic process has been strengthened dramatically from 2008 to the current day, and this election reflected that. In addition, Kenya has an excellent constitution that's well written. It protects the rights of minorities and women. And it also has some very well thought out provisions about land. The bad news, this is the political class. This guy owns about a third of the land in Kenya. This guy clearly is a genocidal maniac. <laughs> this guy, he is very power hungry. He'll stay in the opposition and he'll make noise. That's his, you know, MO. This guy is kind of a pawn. He's the swing guy. He's representing swing communities. But there's a political class in Kenya. It's got members of every tribe. So every tribe is represented in the political class. But then there's everybody else, the citizens, the Wananchi. And the gulf between those groups is very large. So now Kenya has shown that it can run a free and fair and a peaceful election. But the next task is end the dynasty. Why are the major candidates the sons of the major independence leaders? Can we get some other candidates? And then further, we need to implement the Constitution. The Constitution of Kenya is a highly egalitarian document. It draws on the best of constitutions around the world. The land issue has got to be resolved. The major landowners in Kenya are the former three presidents. Kibaki, Moy, and Kenyatta families own are the three largest landowners in Kenya. So there's a lot of, inst there's a lot of work that has to be done on implementing the Constitution and creating a more equal society. Thank you. That was the, the, the uh, new constitution. Did that fail? Yeah, that failed. Okay. So the, there, was, there was an effort to pass constitution in 2005 that was not successful, but in 2010 they did pass a new constitution. Well, th there was a lot of violence around that uh, campaign, too, and part of it uh, run by Rilo Odinga also. So and it was, you know, I, part of the reason it seemed to fail. Yes, he was involved in its failure. The six Kenyans that were killed recently, was that political or um, along um, tribal lines? Um, I'm not sure. I know that during the election there were six police officers killed, but which ones are you referring to? Well, these, these were after the election, I thought. Yeah, I mean, there is, like I said, there's a lot of land violence in different regions of the country. So I personally prefer not to characterize conflicts as tribal or ethnic. I think you always have to look at the underlying social economic problem. So there's probably a resource problem underneath that. My wife and I recently visited Kenya. We were there a couple of uh, months before the election. I read in the p newspaper a, a phrase, our time to eat. Can you speak to that? Yes. Okay, 
there's a famous journalist named Michelle Arong, and she is a British journalist, and she's a great writer, and I loved her book on the Congo, but I found her coverage of Kenya just to be somewhere in between dismaying and ridiculous. But she has a book called Our Time to Eat, and it's about, um, there's a terrific anti-corruption activist, John Gathongo, and she was talking, Our Time to Eat represents different politicians from different ethnic groups thinking it's their turn to go into government so that they can reap the financial rewards of going into government. Unfortunately, in a lot of African countries, people go into government to make money. So they have the system reversed. Here, you don't make much money in government, then you leave government and you make your money. Over there, they use their time in government, especially in Kenya, to sort of plunder the state's resources. So just as an example of that, candidates running in this election and I'm not making up this number, got 100 security guards per person. So our time to eat is the idea that different groups need to get into power to have that opportunity to plunder. Does that answer your question? I think that there's pressure from the populace to reduce that level of plunder. They've reduced the member of parliament salaries significantly, and um, they're really screaming foul. They're very unhappy that their salaries have been reduced. And one good thing about Kenyatta is he's so wealthy that he's not interested in plundering money because his family is so wealthy and he personally has such a high degree of wealth. So he's, he's all set financially. So he's actually maybe kind of the Nixon for China. He may be the guy who can implement some of these financial reforms. And he was Minister of Finance and did a good, credible job as that. Votes that the, that the candidate that is elected all favors then his tribe uh, once he's elected with, uh, uh, say, contracts or monies from the government coffers or along that line, something along that line? Well, sort of. I mean, under Moy, who was the longest running president we, that Kenya has ever had, um, what he did was he systematically underdeveloped the areas of groups that were not his, and he systematically overdeveloped his area. So he definitely did this. But under Kibaki, who is Kikuyu, he did not overdevelop his area and he did a great job of kind of moving infrastructure throughout the country. In particular, he did a great job of building roads throughout the country. And he also made primary education in Kenya free. So I don't think you can say across the board that, you know, each group did it. So for example, um, Kenyatta the first, Jomo Kenyatta, he named Moy as his vice president specifically because he was from a smaller ethnic group and he was trying to show that he was not tribal and he wanted to disperse, um, you know, wealth throughout the population. You can argue whether he did that or not, but... Dr. Bowman, um, what made this election peaceful as opposed to the violence that happened at the last election? That's a great question. The media in Kenya was very, very careful to emphasize the message of peace. And there was a concerted campaign by civil society in the whole year running up to this election about peace. So every group in civil society promoted a message of peace throughout the country, and they also promoted a message of even if we lose, we're going to accept the results. But I also think that, you know, the last election was terrifically violent and devastated the economy, and people had that very much on their mind. So people just didn't want to go back to that place. And also Kenya is surrounded by a number of countries, including you know, that have a history of civil war. And it's always been a haven of stability and peace. And I think people realize at 2007 that they just got too close to the brink. So there was a combination of memories as well as a concerted campaign by civil society and the media. Does that answer your question? Okay. 
Thank you for being here, Dr. Bowman. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, I'm just curious if you could speak to the political climate pre-election in terms of like mudslinging and um, how things happen here, if you could compare that. And then also, um, could you speak to the platforms um, of the candidates? Oh yes, those Thank are you. both two very good questions. So in terms of the, the atmosphere before the election, I mean, I wasn't there, so I have to just rely on my research to, to tell you what I thought. The government implemented a campaign to prevent hate speech. So I don't know if this is true, but they told people that they were monitoring their Facebook messages and their text messages, because in Kenya, everybody is everything over text. So I think this worked because it really reduced the level of hate speech. Now, people were saying, get rid of the outsiders, and by that they meant the county believed that the Rift Valley belongs to them and the outsiders were banned to the people who had settled in there the last hundred years or so. When you say get rid of the outsiders, they, that's a code way of saying we've got to get rid of these non tribes. There was a radio station that was in the vernacular during the last election where similar kinds of hate speech messages were made. So there was a very strong campaign against hate speech during this election. And I did see some, I saw a lot of hate speech, but provocative, let's say. Like I saw one that said, um, it was in Swahili, and it said, vote for Cord because the other guys are in front of the Hague. So basically it was focusing on the ICC. And then a lot of people kept saying vote wisely, vote wisely. And I don't know what that really means other than vote for people. It probably means something like vote for people who won't bring the country into chaos, but that wouldn't necessarily support one party versus another. Um, and then there were some funny, really funny Facebook posts. I saw one because Kenyatta owns Brookside Milk. So it was saying after the election he's gonna lose and he'll be milking the cow. Like I had a picture of him milking the cow. And then after the election, I saw one about Odinga and Kenyatta's talking to Odinga and he says, you know, there's this great series you really should check out. And Odinga says, oh, what is that? And Uhuru says, lost. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, some, there was some speech that was quite entertaining, but you know, people tried to keep it on the humorous side and avoid the, the truly gross statements. Let's give Dr. Bowman a 